Hi, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 24th of June, 2014. Welcome to all listeners, thanks for your support. Currently still here in Ukraine. Sunni rebels in Iraq say they've fully captured the country's main oil refinery in the north of Baghdad. Insurgents led by the group ISIS have overrun a swathe of territory north and west of Baghdad, including Iraq's second biggest city, Mosul. There's also been, also been Israeli airstrikes on Syria, um, and also a Hamas spokesman in the Gaza Strip said at the weekend that Palestinians were headed towards a direct confrontation with Israel. There's been a big increase in tensions in Iraq and the Ukraine situations going on. It seems to me something big is happening um, in the military. My feeling is that the US and UK governments are planning a nice big war for us all and it's not going to be uh, pretty. I heard on the grapevine that Obama feels he has no need to get approval for any military action. And um, I even heard him say in a speech that people need to believe in a supreme power. Sounds to me like the power's going to his head a little. Um, I, I tweeted Obama this week and invited him onto the show, but he declined to comment, uh, which says everything. Actually, it probably doesn't um, say much at all, but uh, I guess he's too busy to talk to us. Um, Pro-Russian rebels in eastern Ukraine say they will be observing a ceasefire until Friday morning, responding to the Ukrainian forces' unilateral ceasefire, which has also been um, supported by Putin. Uh, this announcement was made in Donetsk by Alexander Borodai, a leader of the uh, Donetsk People's Republic, which is defying Kiev. On Friday, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko announced a 15-point peace plan and declared a week-long truce. Let's hope uh, this is a sign of peace. I'm uh, a little bit skeptical, but you know, it never, never hurts to be positive. The UN has warned of an in alarming deterioration in human rights in eastern Ukraine, where separatists are fighting security forces, or at least they were. I think they're still ongoing, although they, they've sort of said there's a ceasefire, but I don't think it's entirely working at the moment. They found, uh, the UN found serious problems of harassment and persecution of ethnic Tatars in uh, Crimea, which was the mainly ethnic Russian uh, region of Ukraine. Let's just hope there are, that the problems here in Ukraine are over. Um, it remains to be seen. We're gonna, I'm going to be leaving in a, in a week or so, and then, but then hope to come back again. So I'll always be keeping an eye on events here. The Queen and Duke of Edinburgh are to visit Northern Ireland uh, later this month and um, in fact they're probably on their way at the moment or, or almost there. They're going to be attending a series of public engagements and uh, Northern Ireland Secretary Theresa Villiers said she was absolutely delighted. Um, this will be a wonderful opportunity to show Her Majesty and His Royal Highness around. I mean I want to make clear, I wish no harm to members of the royal family, but I just I just do not understand what we're doing with the real royal family in this day and age and why people still refer to them as highnesses and bow and curtsy, handing over millions of pounds every year to buy royal yachts, clothes that never wear twice, have holidays abroad, and um, every news article is sickeningly glossed over with almost like Stepford Wives kind of uh, love of this family. Uh, with the only argument for their purpose being they're good for tourism, which I, I think is absolutely not absolute nonsense. I mean, people come to see Buckingham Palace. Uh, they they never meet the royal family, and if Prince Philip was to get his way, every member of the public would be wiped out like a virus. Uh, his words, not mine. Check out his speech on population control, which you can find on YouTube. I'm going to uh, cut down on some of the news this week just so we can go to uh, today's guest. Um, but let's just recap on last episode. We talked to Sarah Bajak again. I talked to Anthony, um, f uh, who's in Ankara, Turkey. And we talked about uh, missing planes and touched on flight MH370 again. An update on what's going on that case this week. I heard that they're, they're now saying the prime suspect in the disappearance of the jet that was carrying the uh, 230 
eight people, or was it 239? I'm not sure. The, the article I'm reading at the moment says 238, but um, the flight went off radar on March the 8th, and Captain Zahari Shah, uh, who joined the airline in 1981, is now the most likely suspect. It just seems to me you know, that they're just making stuff up all the time. The family has denied the rumours that Shah was having mar marital problems, but the police found that Shah had programmed a flight simulator at home to practice a flight far out at sea in the Indian Ocean. Could they be referring to Diego Garcia? Um, and that um, they admit that he had practiced landing at sea in the Indian Ocean, landing on an island with a short runway. This was reported by the New York Daily News. Police found that the simulator was deleted from the computer on February the 3rd. Now, that being said, shouldn't the possibility of a landing on a small island then be investigated? That's just my thinking. You know, if the guy's been practicing, the plane's disappeared, he's practicing landing on a small island. If you look at the evidence, people should be looking at whether the plane has landed on a small island. Um, now, if it didn't, then uh, maybe something else happened, but it's, it's at least worth an investigation, surely. Whatever's happened to the plane, I still find that uh, too many things do not add up about this story. Uh, too many constant twists and turns. It's almost becoming a joke now, but not a very funny one, obviously. Um, I hope that there's some progress being made on the uh, appeal for money. Actually, to be honest, the millions that um, the fund that Sarah was talking about, you know, e even if they don't get those millions, I don't think it'll be a wasted exercise, personally. I think just um just getting people to think about it still keeping it in the news getting people to contribute giving people the opportunity to uh, come forward and say something if they do have any secret information that's definitely going to be worthwhile uh, don't forget to leave comments in the comments section um, if you've got any ideas on future shows i mean a lot of the time um you know I am helped by people who are suggesting guests and things like Douglas Dietrich, who's our guest today. I know that one of our listeners helped in um, inspiring him to come on. So uh, thanks, thanks for that. And if you if you have a someone that you would like us to talk to, then you could contact them directly. Contact the person, say uh, say that they they could come and speak to us on Truth Sentinel, and then we can get in touch with them. I came across a video on the net which I've posted on Facebook and Twitter which is uh, Bill Clinton apologizing for human experiments on people by the CIA. Now many of these experiments are alleged to have focused on mind control, erasing people's minds etc. There was court cases over this so this is not a conspiracy. Um, it's quite incredible that governments would be capable of this, I mean experiment on people with, against their will. And it does astound me that despite such cases which have occurred and historically are a fact, the majority of people still label any suggestion that the government are engaged in criminal acts such as this as conspiracy. Um, it's just it's just stupidity to do, to actually say that when it's it's already happened, and you've got people like Bill Clinton apologising for it, which was at least reasonably good of him to do that. Um, there's plenty of information on the internet on what went on with CIA mind control projects, so I'll leave it to listeners to do their own research on that. But maybe my next guest will be able to shed light on both that and other dubious practices that may be occurring in other government institutions such as the military. And um, he'll be talking about allegations of uh, satanic practices. Douglas Dietrich is my next guest, as I mentioned. Uh, Douglas was a Department of Defense research librarian, and Mr. Dietrich was responsible for document destruction. He also became entangled in exposing child sexual abuse scandals. Um, Douglas has appeared as a guest on shows such as Coast to Coast, uh, Caravan to Midnight, and um, often controversial but never boring. Um, I was delighted to have the chance to speak with him and I'll, I'm going to split the show into two halves because we spoke at, at quite length. So today's show is part one. We'd originally attended to speak about um, zombies and vampires but we talked about other stuff instead and we just sort of decided to, to see where the conversation would go. We'll talk about zombies and vampires on another show for sure. There is some colourful language in some bits, um, so I wanted just to warn you. Rather than editing everything out and beeping and stuff that, I just wanted to let you know. And if um, you know, if you do have children around, around, you might want to turn the sound down at some point. So that's just a warning. Without further ado, let's listen to what Douglas has to say. 
Hello, Douglas. Hi, Mr. Sentinel. I'm really glad to be here with you. It's an honor to be here with your listenership on the Truth Sentinel program. No, the, uh, the honor is all ours to have you on as a guest. We really appreciate you taking the time um, to come and speak to us because um, I know you've got a lot of information about lots of different subjects and um, I know today we we're going to th- sort of talk about zombies, vampires and voodoo, but we're also going to cover any any other subjects that come up. So, um, you know, I'll, basically, what do you want? What would you like to talk about first? Well, I'd like to talk about anything that uh, your audience feels is important, and I think that uh, what is always something that uh, is important to the population in general is uh, a lot of uh, what happens to people that they recognize or people that they're familiar with through media. So that would include celebrities. And I think that in nature of what I specialize in, or if we could dignify it by that term, my manager is actually someone who has been working with the topic of mind control for a very long time. Uh, and super soldiery is a subtopic of that. So she has organized two topics, uh, excuse me, two summits in a row uh, called Super Soldier Summits 1 and 2. And by the third annual uh, summit that we've held, which was just a few days ago, and uh, it was uh, extremely uh, tied in to what people have been hearing about in the media with the so-called Las Vegas revolution shooters, Basically, that was known as the Mind Control Summit. So we kind of subsumed the topic of super soldiery within the overarching topic of mind control. I'm going to, of course, allow uh, her to speak to that much more in depth with you when you have her on in the near future. But as for myself, I think that that's a good place to start. I spoke about it just the other day on Joyce Riley's Power Hour. And uh, I put the link to that of the MP3 of that uh, digitally archived audio up on my Facebook timeline, we can uh, bring up a bit about how people can access a lot of uh, th- things I've done in the past through that and my website as, the, uh, as our interview progresses. But uh, one of the things that I think has a lot to do with mind control and what ultimately impacts a lot of these celebrities would be this topic of super soldiery, what happened in Las Vegas. Um, this does tie in with uh, ultimately what happened to Peaches Jeldoff, a, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly in light of her passing. Uh, and she, of course, is someone of, uh, who's recognized across the Atlantic and a citizen of uh, the United Kingdom when she was alive, uh, one of your country people, if I, if I am to guess your citizenship correctly. That's right. My oven has suddenly started making a pinging noise. I hope it's uh, <laughs> hope it's okay. I, did, I didn't. I haven't even got anything cooking, so uh, that's very that's very odd, very odd indeed. Um, never mind. Yeah, Peaches Geldof uh, passed away unfortunately um, some some time ago, and um, that was quite unexpected. But I, I mean, these days there are a lot of celebrities that seem to um, die unexpectedly at a young age, and it, it always seems to be put down to to drugs, um, you know, they find a, a bottle of pills next to them. And do you think that's the case? Well, it, it's interesting you bring that up. I think that some of these cases are uh, actual suicides, and uh, some of these cases are just uh, drug overdoses are accidents. And uh, the, by the way, by that I would mean that uh, that the individuals who were victims of that were somehow... Good God, that's maddening. Is there, <laughs> is there uh, something? Hang on a second. I'm going to have to try and sort this blooming oven out. I don't know what the hell is happening here. I, I, I'm renting an apartment in, uh, in Odessa, and uh, there's all kinds of machines in this place, and I have no idea how to work the damn thing. Okay, so uh, thank goodness uh, my uh, host was dealing with some electronic harassment all of his own, and uh, he was able to uh, attend to that. Uh, and uh, finally, he got some of his machines to cooperate with him, and uh, which is uh, quite the accomplishment on his part, since he doesn't speak any of the local language, at least not to the point yet, where he can read the directions of the machinery in Odessa of Ukraine uh, with any great sense of, uh, shall we say, scanning speed. <laughs> so uh, that would be great. correct. Yeah, that would be correct. <laughs> luckily, the uh, luckily the cooker turned itself off, uh, despite me pressing. I don't think it was anything to do with the, me pressing all the buttons on the cooker. It just uh, decided to leave me alone after a while. 
Well, maybe maybe the way that you stuck your head in it, it's some kind of safety mechanism. <laughs> maybe it did. That could have been it. Yeah. <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, we'll turn towards uh, another, uh, or rather a kind of trigger mechanism instead when it comes to the sociology of the United States and work our way back to Peaches Geldof, who deserves attention. Obviously, uh, what uh, has happened recently in the United States has been the Las Vegas shooting. And uh, that uh, happened in direct concurrence with what uh, my managers had uh, produced, which was the Mind Control Summit. We had gone a bit into the topic of super soldiery, uh, how that phenomena kind of crosses the Atlantic. We'll continue uh, kind of exploring that as the conversation continues. And in terms of what we were dealing with in this particular summit was that... Uh, uh, satanic ritual abuse, which uh, ties into the Peaches Geldof case, as well as uh, the um, concept of super soldiery, electronic harassment, which obviously ties into the Scott Sentinel case that we've just seen, <laughs> and uh, uh, various other kinds of uh, gang stalking of targeted individuals. All of this ties under the concept of mind control. Now, I myself am stranded in the city of San Francisco. Unless someone is fabulously wealthy, nobody really chooses to live in San Francisco, where more or less uh, the majority of the population is stranded here. Uh, the, if you have rent control, you can barely afford to live here, but you'll never be able to save enough money to move. Uh, that's kind of the trap that people in San Francisco are in. That sounds, now, so, um, sounds very similar to London, then. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to survive there, you know? Yes, yes. I was about to say, three of the most expensive cities in the world, of course, are well known. They are London, New York City, and Tokyo. Uh, but a lot of people forget San Francisco, which actually, uh, during uh, uh, certain years, or a good number of years, actually supersedes those three major cities in cost, unbelievably. And uh, that goes to show you just how, how bad it is here. Because it's such a small peninsula, it, it would be about uh, a kind of like Manhattan Island in New York City, where everything is stuck together, or uh, downtown London, where everything is just terribly congested. Uh, so without going too much into the population demographics of major metropolitan areas, <laughs> metropolitan area, <laughs> let's, uh, go, going back to what we were saying about San Francisco, the reason I brought that up is has an enormous uh, tie to the concept of mind control developed, uh, the development of mind control technologies. And an enormous amount of experimentation uh, went on here for decades during the time of the hippie counterculture and uh, is still going on to this day. We'll bring up some examples of that as the conversation uh, continues. But uh, what did happen was that uh, I, I live on what is known as Russian Hill, which used to be uh, obviously a very predominantly Russian district, which is ironic in the sense that, of course, our friend Scott Sentinel is over in the predominantly Russian-speaking area of Odessa right now. And we have a small Russian cemetery on top of which all of the residences were built. And uh, it was in this area that uh, I had a neighbor, uh, I use the term had quite poignantly, named uh, Ryan Kelly Chamberlain II. And Ryan Kelly Chamberlain II uh, was someone who I would see uh, all the time. He was very hard to miss. He was about six foot uh, three inches tall and about uh, probably around 150, excuse me, two, about, about 250 pounds. So uh, big guy and uh, never got to know him, of course, or speak to him because uh, that's what happens in a major city. Everybody goes about their business. There's no real time to talk to each other most of the time. And uh, when I took off to the Mind Control Summit for the weekend of the 30th through the 31st of uh, May, going into the first of this month, the 1st of June, this uh, weekend that uh, transferred us from one month into another uh, was the time of our three-day Mind Control Summit in Las Vegas. Now, while I was in Las Vegas, the day that I left, apparently, the very next day, the very next morning, uh, not apparently, but uh, um, uh, shall we say catastrophically for the individuals involved, uh, the FBI uh, raided uh, the my next door uh, domicile, which was the home of Ryan Kelly Chamberlain II, and they basically cordoned off 
all of Russian Hill, which is between Chinatown and North Beach in San Francisco. Uh, they sealed it down, shut it down as a uh, potential disaster area on the basis of the housing in the residence next door to mine. So they claimed of weapons of mass destruction. They brought in a nuclear emergency search team, acronymed NEST, uh, N-E-S-T, and they brought in the biohazard teams, literally men in moon suits. And uh, they claimed that there was radiological materials for the construction of dirty bombs. They claimed that there were uh, ricin, a number of other mass destructive poisons. Uh, they uh, busted into this guy's home, tore it all apart, uh, and uh, put out a national all-points bulletin for this individual. In other words, they organized a national manhunt on the spot. <laughs> a national, just throughout all the 50 states, looking for this guy. And uh, they captured him within, uh, obviously, about uh, hours. Uh, he was in a bar, the Mad Dog in the far Fog, the Mad Dog in the Fog bar in Haight-Ashbury District of San Francisco, which is a renowned uh, hippie counterculture area from the 60s, later on a skinhead area, and now just kind of like a, uh, kind of like a crash and burnout area. <laughs> <laughs> and when he was there drinking, he had no concept he was in the news, had no idea what was going on. Uh, and uh, they took him down and uh, took him to the San Francisco Hall of Justice. He will go inside of the federal penitentiary system, and you will never hear of this individual again. What's, uh, had, what's he charged with then? Uh, oh, basically, uh, as I said uh, originally when I brought up all the charges, they charged him with everything, everything you could think of. I mean, they were bringing in biohazard teams. They were bringing in the nuke teams. They were bringing, basically, he had, they were saying he was like a regular uh, Saddam Hussein, that he had uh, weapons of mass destruction, WMDs up the ass, and mm -hmm. that this guy was manufacturing them in his home, purifying ricin, you know, uh, taking industrial grade uh, nuclear materials and manufacturing Bombs. And, of course, with that, of course, they could seal off all the media, and uh, they uh, did so. And uh, since the time that they evacuated him, uh, they came out with, basically, they found absolutely nothing of any substance whatsoever. They are, they are bringing up the, the most ridiculous uh, things imaginable, uh, basically. Uh, they had informed the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and the Department of Homeland Security that he had uh, accumulated all this evil stuff. But in the end, what they are talking about was that they found ground rosary peas. Ground rosary peas, which you can grow in your backyard. The plant from which abrin is processed. Now, abrin, of course, is potentially deadly. Uh, it, it, but uh, Abrin is something that would require uh, industrial level laboratories to process uh, from your ground rosary peas. So that's what they've got him on. He will spend the rest of his life rotting in jail with that. He will be entirely uh, just um, separated from media, very similar to uh, the partner of uh, the man who blew up uh, Oklahoma City's federal building, Timothy McVeigh's partner, Terry Nichols. Uh, has absolutely no access to media. It will be the same with this poor bastard. And what he is truly guilty of is being next door neighbor to a major whistleblower, which is myself. And since that period of time, they've been totally deconstructing the interior of his domicile, stripping its walls, and installing just a ton of surveillance equipment, which is painfully obvious. They're bringing it in through the front and back doors. And I can see both doors because I'm his next door neighbor. And they're bringing in uh, any number of uh, scanners and uh, audio recorders, all the rest of that. And they're just plastering it up against his wall directly facing my rooms. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's basically what happened while I was gone. But the work in which they've deconstructed and re-equipped his facility uh, has been going on since I returned. So they, uh, uh, they might be listening to the show then. Uh, well, you know, but that's part of the idiocy, right? I mean, they could so easily listen to it, but I guess they want to listen to it, you know, in advance, before it gets edited, before it gets, uh, you, you know, um, basically put up on the uh, digital archives so that they can be a step ahead of the game if we have any plans to, uh, you know, uh, make you the next president of Ukraine or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen in a hurry. Well, hey, uh, aren't you the man behind the Darth Vader mask? <laughs> No, I, I, actually, I mean, the guy they, that's, uh, they've got in charge now, Poroshenko, I mean, um, he seems almost half decent in comparison to some previous um, 
Ukrainian president. So um, at least and at least he makes good chocolate. That's what I'd say. I mean, he, <laughs> ma he, he makes. Uh, he's a, the owner of the Russian chocolate business, and uh, I've tried the chocolate. It's fantastic. That's great. Well, by the way, Mr. Sentinel, uh, sukola, by the way, is the Russian word for it, I believe. Uh, and okay. uh, one of the things that you can do so that I don't look like I'm spouting non sequiturs, you can confirm to our listenership that there is a man who was part of the Jedi Party or the Sith Party who is running for president of Ukraine was at the time of the election. Yeah, I, I they, seem to remember hearing something like that, yeah. Yeah, well, I well, we saw photos of him uh, over here in the West. He was the most recognized candidate in the West. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure he was quite peripheral and uh, nothing more than a novelty where you're at in in the place where he was running. But uh, yeah, at any rate, uh, so in terms of uh, going back to how all of this connects, uh, while we were um, holding the summit. We had a number of experiencers that were relating their personal experiences with the electronic harassment, the destruction, the dismantling, the deconstruction of their lives, their very sense of reality, uh, by uh, what was, um, in the end, one could only conclude to be some tremendously funded social experiment on the part of the United States government. Now, uh, all anyone needs to do is look up the LSD psychedelic experiments as conducted by the CIA back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, in the majority, they were conducted right here in San Francisco, where I live. And one can get a hint of some of what was going down at the time in terms of destroying people's sense of reality, uh, destroying their lives. Uh, the government uh, is on record as having done this. Yeah, uh, I think um, I think I saw a video the other day of Bill Clinton uh, apologizing for some of this, these mind control experiments they did on people. I, I, didn't they literally sometimes just drag people off the street and do some do uh, mind control experiments on them? Yes, yes, this is true. And uh, what you are speaking of, by the way, was uh, Clinton's um, uh, organization of a, a presidential investigation into what was originally radiation experiments. So if people look up the radiation experiments and the uh, government, uh, the federal report on the results of what the uh, department, uh, what used to be known as the Atomic Energy Commission, the, uh, AAC, the uh, AEC, and it became later on the, uh, the, I believe it was, it's called the Department of Energy now, or the DOE. But uh, that is the successor department because the Atomic Energy Commission were, became so uh, infamous for doing exactly what you've just articulated that uh, people were going to rise up in revolt. And uh, the American government headed it off at the past by dismantling the agency and uh, introducing a new one to take its place that was supposedly reformed. Now, with the dismantling of the old agency, the government burned and destroyed all of those records. So uh, whatever they could find survived by accident, as documents are wont to do, and uh, they were leaked by whistleblowers such as myself over the years. I did indeed leak a number of those Atomic Energy Commission experiments because they were conducted in conjunction with stellar universities such as the University of Rochester in New York, UCSF or the University of California at San Francisco here in the Greater Bay Area and of course all of this was done in cooperation with Letterman Army Medical Center where 25 percent of the military doctors in the United States Army were trained and uh, that closed of course along with the military base in 1995 but LAMSI or Letterman Army Medical Center was participating in getting the results from UCSF which was testing radioactive, was, which was basically uh, injecting or uh, aerosolizing radioactive materials and uh, placing them into uh, confined prison areas, uh, into public areas. Uh, it was just, uh, it's obscene. But these aren't just like, uh, shall we say, um, universities that are in podunk or someplace like that. These are universities with major equipment and major government funding for research. So all of this is something that President Clinton quite rightly uh, apologized for. And in that regard, it makes him, in my opinion, uh, for that alone at least, he has to be admired as one of the better presidents. If for nothing else, as, as uh, ridiculous as his behavior was, I think it was far more comedic than it was 
uh, uh, shall we say, um, provocative of a sense of horror like you get with so many other uh, executive heads of state in the United States. And didn't but, they um, didn't they give compensation to some of the people involved in those experiments? Oh, but it was so worthless. I mean, how can you compensate for something like that? The majority of the people were dead. They obviously died because they were injecting them with extremely deadly radioactive materials into their system. They were uh, also extremely de deadly chemicals. Overdoses of LSD uh, will fry your brains to the point where they can give you all the money in the world. You won't know how to spend it. <laughs> they, uh, and this was um, this was all against their will as well. I mean, they they didn't um, actually comply with this, right? Of course. Well, it was not against the, the better way to say it. You would be against their will if they had known about it and were forced to do it against their consent. It was done without their knowing. <laughs> This was mm. done without their even knowing it was being done. Uh, it gave you examples of this. They would uh, take radioactive isotopes and they would place them into the breakfast cereal of retarded children who were in special care facilities. So that's that's is, unbelievable, isn't it? It's like, um, it, you know, if that's true, and um, I've no reason oh, it, to doubt it's true. it. Is, that, yeah, uh, that was I mean, true. I, think, I think that's uh, that's partly what Bill Clinton was apologizing for. But people forget these things, don't they? They, they still trust. A lot of people do trust the government, and they they forget these things that have happened in the past. It always amazes me that people are so quick to forget when when these cases are actually in the open now. Yes. Well, the reason for that is, in, in a sense, it's quite simple. Uh, it's not even so much forgetfulness. You, if you speak to the majority of people in the United States, uh, there is a tremendous cynicism and a tremendous distrust of the government. The asininity, the, the true insanity in the United States, uh, the pathology emerges it, when, of course, you try to stir them to some means of uh, actual commitment to learning what's going on behind the dynamics of why they don't trust the government. People have an inherent distrust but they don't want to know why, because the reality of what the government is doing is so painful that your average person, when confronted with what the government has done to them, to their generations before them, what the government's been doing for decades since the onset of the Second World War, the majority of people would have to put up or shut up. They would have to face the moral choice of... I can no longer pay taxes to this government. Or they would have to say, I have to pick up a gun and rebel violently. I can no longer consider myself a citizen of this criminal enterprise. So when faced with that kind of choice, one can say, who can blame them, that they sink instead back into apathy and really take the position of, I don't want to know. Now, what makes it all so repulsive and uh, what needs to be taken into account is that ultimately, of course, whatever a government does, ultimately, it's the population that supports that government with taxes that is responsible. And uh, the difference between uh, what went on in the Third Reich and what went on in the United States is that in the time of the Third Reich, which is something that the Americans always present, as, and, and the Russians do too, <laughs> as this ultimate epitome of evil, uh, though the Russians are far more realistic about it, especially when uh, they, they are more accepting of the horrors of the Soviet totalitarian system than Americans are of the horrors of their so-called democratic system. But in terms of what happens in the United States, you've got this population that points their fingers at the Third Reich all the time by saying our government is becoming more Nazi-like. And it, what makes it so absurd, of course, is that if our government were truly run by Nazis who had come over from across the Atlantic and reorganized the American system, uh, the trains would run on time. There would be no uh, phenomenon of homelessness because all those people would be committed to camps. <laughs> there would be no phenomena of this kind of, uh, shall we say, unemployment because everyone would be mobilized to work in the armaments industry and uh, we wouldn't have less than 1% of our population in the military because we would be a militarized society. We wouldn't have this enormous problem of uh, giant ghettos of ethnically enclaved populations 
all over the United States because the United States would be racially segregated. There are so many obvious things into what a national socialist government, a Nazi government, would do in the United States, but everyone keeps pointing their fingers at this nebulous Nazification of the United States, the reality is it is a purely American phenomena in terms of the evil that has been engendered by American culture itself. And the difference primarily between the United States and the Third Reich was that the National Socialist government, the NSDAP or the National Socialist Deutsches Arbeiterpartei, the Labour Party of the German peoples, is that they were literally voted in legally. They were 10% of the population, and no one, it never really expanded beyond that, though one had to be realistically a member of the party in order to advance in terms of any real paying profession or, or a profession with great benefits and rewards. Uh, obviously, one had to be a member of the party to succeed in that regard, but nevertheless, despite all of that, uh, the reality was that there was never more than 10% of the German population that was ever uh, card-carrying members of the NSDAP, or the Nazi Party. Uh, and of those 10, uh, of that party itself, only 10% were Schutzstaffel, or SS, and of that, only 10% were Waffen-SS, or weaponized SS, serving in the fields, and of that, only 10% were Totenkopfverbande, or the concentration camp guards, the death head units, which were also deployed for combat. And uh, so we have this, this phenomenon, and of those, by the way, the Totten Kopferband, uh, SSTV, of those only 10% were actual scientific experimental doctors who were researching the genetics of the human uh, differences in race, uh, differences in twinning, as was the specialty of Dr. Mengele, and uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, who has become the infamous angel of death or the personification of Nazism, you're talking about 10% of 10% of 10% of 10%. Now, in the United States, on the other hand, everyone is either an independent party, more and more people, libertarian, but the majority of people are still uh, Republican or Democrat, and uh, either government has been responsible for heinous atrocities, and as you say, in full light of the American public, unlike the Third Reich, where the reality was the Konzentslagen, or the concentration camps, were not public. They were part of a covert operation, and the majority of them were outside of Deutschland, or outside of Germany. So you've got the situation where the reality was the average German person honestly did not know what was going on in terms of die Endlosung, or the final solution, what has come down to us in popular culture as the Holocaust. Um, so Doug, Douglas, I just wanted to ask you about the um, the Nazis um, and Operation Paperclip. You know, uh, a lot of people say that there was some relocations of some of these people that were doing the experiments. Do you know? Uh, do you know how much truth there is in that? Oh, there's an enormous amount of truth. But you have to remember, uh, bringing scientists over as technical advisors is not transferring a government to administer your nation's state. Werner von Braun uh, came to the United States, and his brother Magnus, uh, Magnus von Braun, went to the Soviet Union. Now, uh, the reason, uh, the, now, the fact that this is unknown to anybody is beyond me, <laughs> but it happens to be a fact. Both of them, more than anything else, served to misdirect and sabotage the rival space programs of the United States and the Soviet Union, because if they had truly put their all and efforts behind it, we would be established at, uh, at the very least on the moon and Mars with colonies by now. But uh, in reality, uh, Werner von Braun always said, you know, my brother was the lucky one, because his brother at least got to work with a very serious totalitarian state that had the busiest cosmodromes in the world. Uh, all of the space programs depend on Russian uplift at this point in history, the remnants of the Soviet space program, and the Soviets, of course, have stated that when America's contract runs out, they're not going to fly Americans to the International Space Station anymore. And since everyone counts on Russian transport to get to the ISS, that means it's going to turn into a purely Russian space station. <laughs> So, oh, in terms of America's uh, space efforts, it all died. The Americans had no intention of doing anything. Yeah, I, always, um, I always wondered why um, 
there was there wasn't so many trips to the the moon after the 70s the early 70s i think they stopped then and then you know there didn't seem to be any more trips after that and i always always wondered what was going on up there well there was a, a multiple amount of factors the uh in terms of um, what uh happened with the moon what people tend to think of we're talk we we speak about uh, the occult in uh the elite paradigm uh the this is something that i think cannot be overemphasized as a citizen of the united kingdom yourself uh you are probably painfully aware of the undercurrent of occult investigation that has always been part of the upper class and one of the manifestations of this was the hellfire club and the hellfire club of course as was quite real uh, is still quite real, but nowhere near at the level of power brokering that it was at the time of the height of the British Empire. But a lot of this started off with uh, Queen um, Elizabeth and her obsession with the occult and her uh, relationship that she had with uh, Mr. D. And John D., of course, was the original 007. Uh, that was how he signed himself, a double O and a seven. And John D. was the last officially recognized royal sorcerer. And as the royal sorcerer, he was uh, credited with raising the storm that sank the Spanish Armada. Now, there's no denying the fact that he uh, used scrying with his Irish assistant to identify a Spanish plot that was in the British uh, Isles at the time to burn the forests of the British Isles and uh, therefore uh, prevent the ability of the British to raise a fleet or construct one. So by stymieing that uh, plot in terms of massive sabotage, he proved his worth as an intelligence officer and established one of the world's first intelligence agencies, probably the world's first uh, Western intelligence agency. Now, his success in this regard uh, combined the science of the occult or the study of the occult with the science of intelligence. And they've been really inseparable ever since. So with the British, they developed a military occult complex, and this was aped, if you will, by the Americans. But the British, of course, John Dee was never a Satanist. Later on, there was that taint of Satanism that began to infect the British upper class. That's where the Hellfire Club came in. So you had at that time when the British ruled India, you had an enormous amount of sacrifice that was going on of millions of Indians. Now, how on earth would this happen? What on earth am I talking about? Well, people can look this up themselves on a search engine do their own research. Uh, the British are most famous in their cloudy little island uh, for wonderful hedgerows and magnificent gardens, which uh, shows how good they are at this because they're in a climate which is hardly conducive to such. So the fact that the British were able to raise these hedgerows made them consummate botanists. And when they went down to India, the British Raj discovered that British hedgerows in the equatorial tropical climate of India mutated and became monstrous thorn brushes that could be turned into a form of wall. And as a matter of fact, they did what later on the Germans emulated in the Bocage country of France after D-Day. One of the things that Irvin the Royal Mail did was he set up an enormous network of in-depth defense in the French Bocage country, which became known to the Americans as Hedgerow Hell. He hollowed out all of the thorn uh, bushes uh, within the Bocage area of France, and within these hollowed out thorn bushes, which were quite angular in nature, they were uh, established sniper's posts, mortar uh, uh, batteries, uh, and uh, various other uh, in-depth defenses, machine gun nests, that tore the Americans apart. Far more Americans died uh, in the Bocage country than died at D-Day. And uh, far more suffered psychological breakdowns from the constant attacks from all sides, uh, the uh, need to investigate every single bush. And uh, they finally attached giant forklifts to their tanks to just roll over the uh, hedgerows and whatever was inside of them. Now, the British went far beyond that. And during the, role, the rule of the Raj, they established 
a giant hedgerow network that mutated into what became known as the Great British Wall of India. They divided India into four quarters, well, literally crucified the entire subcontinent with a wall going from north to south and a wall going from east to west, and they were able to divvy up and decide who lived, who died, who got food distributed, and when any area was in rebellion, who starved to death, who didn't get medical supplies. Because of their policies worked around this wall, millions of Asian Indians died. Well, many people interpreted this as in India, quite correctly, as a massive sacrifice to very negative entities that fed off that kind of human suffering. And this traced back to the Hellfire Club. Uh, the majority of members of the upper class of Britain were members of this Hellfire Club. And they were learning all of the dark arts of Indian yoga and Kundalini in the most negative sense and channeling a lot of this energy using the energy of the human sacrifices that were ongoing in India. This is a holocaust of monumental proportions. Far more people died under British rule in India than ever died under the rule of the Third Reich. Of course, British are never educated in it, but if any Britisher starts investigating the Great Wall, the Great Hedge of India, they will find out everything I am saying is true. And what and about the uh, the Hellfire Club? Is that still continuing to this day? It still is. As I said, they're not the power brokers that they once were. And I'll tell you why. Because the Americans took over the field. Uh, to give you an example of this, I was uh, assigned liaison status to the officially recognized satanic chaplain of the United States Army for nearly a decade. I was a Department of Defense research librarian. I worked at El Presidio Real de San Francisco. Uh, the individual who was also stationed there was Colonel Michael Aquino. Now, Colonel Michael Angelo Aquino uh, was able to retire as a colonel. He was, in a sense, forced into retirement after a number of hell hellish scandals at the Presidio Military Base, which we'll get into uh, in a moment, uh, should you have the stomach to listen to it. Well, I'll just summarize them briefly. They had to do with child molestation. But what had happened in the Presidio Military Base was that in the 1980s, when I was working uh, at Presidio, uh, the United States had a global empire that it had stolen from the British and everyone else that it could steal from. And uh, all over this empire, it had established military bases, many that don't exist anymore. There were bases in West Germany. There were bases in uh, South Korea, Okinawa, the Philippines. Now, the United States has been forced to withdraw from Germany. There, uh, whatever is maintained in Germany is uh, simply hospitals that are in cooperation with the German government. The United States has not occupied Germany for many, many years, decades, as a matter of fact. And uh, that's I bring that up pointedly because so many people in America are so e-historic. That's the historical version of illiterate. They're so e-historic. They have no idea that the Berlin Wall has fallen down. <laughs> that that, that uh, Germany kicked the Americans out. This is how Americans are. They have no connection with reality. But at any rate, in terms of uh, what happened with all of these military bases, they had all kinds of workers who were not just soldiers in uniform, but DOD bureaucrats with wives, children, officers with wives and children, and they all needed daycare centers. So uh, one thing I'm sure you and I can agree on, or anybody with any sense of rationality can agree on, Whatever a military should be, the one thing a military should never be is a family environment. Well, at the time in the 80s, when I was working as a DOD bureaucrat, a research librarian in liaison with Colonel Michael Aquino, the Army's officially recognized satanic chaplain, at that time, the United States Army was caring for 100,000 children a day worldwide. 100,000 children every day worldwide were in its daycare centers. Now, literally, half a thousand of these kids, 500, were at the Presidio Military Base of San Francisco in one of their largest daycare centers. Now, it turned out my high school teacher, Gary Willard Hambright, who taught at the vocational institute that I went to school at, he was federally indicted by a federal grand jury for the sexual assault of no less than 14 children, all of them under four years of age because he managed the Presidio Daycare Center. Now, if he had not died of AIDS while he was on trial, he would have been indicted for hundreds 
more assaults. And he was responsible, it was calculated, for infecting around half a thousand kids with AIDS. And at that period in time, there was no internet as we know it today. The internet was developed by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And because of what happened at the Presidio military's base, they stalled the public release of the internet as a technology for half a decade. And very few people had access to any kind of internet as we would understand it today. One of the original companies that provided information electronically was a company known as Electricity, spelled with an I at the end instead of a Y here in San Francisco. Now, they were releasing electronically all kinds of information about Lieutenant Colonel, at that time it was the Lieutenant Colonel, Michael Aquino, being accused of raping these kids along with my high school teacher, Gary Willard Hambright. And as a result, he sued electricity. It went all the way up to the San Francisco General Court, and he lost. He also sued the U.S. Army to take his name off of the uh, CID, the Criminal Investigations Division of the United States Army, to take his name off the CID list of child molestation suspects. He sued the Army, and he lost. <laughs> and one of the reasons why he lost both lawsuits was because the children described him physically to the exact degree. And they said, this man sexually raped me. And they described his home. And when his home was raided by Inspector Pamphloff of the San Francisco Police Department, they went inside his home and the home was exactly as the children described it. Now, this guy never spent a day in jail. Neither did Gary Willard Hambright, my vocational instructor, who would have spent the rest of his life in jail, but he died of AIDS. Now, this is all part of the super soldier program. Now, what does this mean? How could that be? What kind of super soldier does this have to do with? Well, there was a lot of experimentation. This is something to know about Colonel Michael Aquino. Colonel Michael Aquino was a psychological warfare expert. He worked with PSYOPs, the chaplaincy of Satanism that he was recognized for in the army was his secondary responsibility. He was actually an intelligence analyst specialist who specialized in psyops that combined the occult on the same basis that John D. combined the occult in service to his queen. Now, one of the things that Colonel Michael Aquino explained to me was the fact, and this is reality, people who investigate his background can vet everything I'm saying. His background is quite public because the individual was put on a number of trials, as I've just described. And all of this was made public. It is, a, it is a public record. Now, also a public record was the fact that he had international security clearances. He was on second mint to NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, of which the United Kingdom and the United States are primary members. He also uh, was a member of the WAC, the World Affairs Council. So as a result, he had international security clearances. And this is why you've got many so-called super soldiers who are really super victims of child molestation. You have super soldiers like the British citizen Max Spears, last name spelled S-P-I-E-R-S. -E Max Spears is a Britisher who's in England right now, and he has solid memories of running into Michael Aquino, who was essentially cultivating him and indoctrinating him. So you're talking about people who remember Michael Aquino both sides of the Atlantic. As a matter of fact, one of the things he's most notorious for is a satanic ritual conducted in the SS castle of Wevelsburg in Germany in the 1980s. What most people don't understand is that Satanism and National Socialism are two very different phenomena. The National Socialistisch were a combination of what you would call Nordism or Evangelical Nordicism, uh, a Nordic paganism, and a combination of Christian Gnosticism or heretical Christianity that was based on gnosis, or intimate knowledge, or communion with divinities, as opposed to paistis, or faith, which would be the basis of Christian churches. So the Gnostics produced various heretical movements, such as the Cathars in France, whom the Roman Catholic Church ordered a crusade against and exterminated. 
Now, the National Socialists came more of that tradition of intimate communion in a pagan sense with the Viking gods of the Norse and bringing that into the 20th century and the third millennium. That has nothing to do with Satanism. Satanism, of course, was very threatened by this revivalism of paganism, which is occurring all over Europe. There is more of a sense of Slavonic paganism, of Nordic paganism. Europe now is edging out of Christianity and returning to its spiritual indigenous roots, whereas the Satanists are trying to overwhelm the United States through ritual abuse and control of the media. Now, one of the things that uh, Colonel Michael Aquino was assigned to do as a NATO officer was to go into Wevelsburg Castle, uh, which was uh, established by Heinrich Kimmler, the Reichsführer of the Schutzstaffel of the SS, and conduct a suppression ritual in which he conducted an inversion ritual to try and keep the spirit of the old Norse gods at bay for at least another decade or two so that Satanism would get the upper hand to triumph in the Western world. And uh, people can look up this ritual that he did at Wevelsburg Castle. It is, again, a matter of public record. He was finally evicted, or ejected, if you will, from Germany, because the National Socialistisch, both the old guard and the neo-Nazi skinheads, rallied together and pointed out to the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, or the Federal Republic of German government, that he was basically committing sacrilege and desecrating a national monument. Um, can I ask, what, um, what actually was the ritual that he was doing then? The ritual that he was conducting was, as I said, an inversion ritual, a suppression ritual. If I went into the details of that, it would take hours. I would confess I don't remember them consciously. I would literally have to look through my notes. Mm. But in terms of the point of the ritual, that is something that you can take to the bank. Uh, what else would he be doing in there as a Satanist? He has no communion with the old uh, pagan Norse gods. So it's not his religion that he was uh, operating in the name of. He was operating in the name of the religion of the military junta of the United States. One of the things that he ex had explained to me was the fact that just as the old original culture of the Greeks, the Spartans, the Macedonians, the Hellenic world had cultivated a pantheon of powerful deities and divinities, gods that were the interacting with every moment of their lives. And just as the Greeks were able to commune with these gods, uh, the best thing to read about this would be the uh, breakdown of the bicameral mind by Julian James. Uh, that book uh, basically talks about the birth of consciousness as we understand it today and the uh, shriveling up or the vestigialism of our ability to directly commune with divine voices that people would hear all the time, all the way up to Joan of Arc. Now, the Greeks would hear these all the time and feel that they were in communion with the gods. Now, this is what is known as Gnosis. This is what the Nazis were into, or the National Socialistic as neo-pagans. Now, in terms of the Hellenic world, they were ultimately absorbed by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was basically an unimaginative, acculturated, that means uh, non-cultural, uh, garrison state. They were just basically a military police state that had developed no culture of its own of any consequence other than that of militarization. And as a result, having no creativity and no sense of uh, real culture, they stole, literally appropriated, all of the gods of ancient Greece. And they made them their own. Aphrodite became Venus, uh, Ares became Mars, uh, Jove became uh, Zeus, or Zeus became Jove, excuse me. And uh, the Americans, as Colonel Michael Aquino had explained to me, had stolen the devils of Greater Britain. And that was why the British Empire had died and withered up on the vine so quickly that the British Empire under Bomber Harris was making one last desperate attempt with the nighttime bombing to make so many human sacrifices at Dresden and other major German cities, which they turned into open-air infernos. Firestorms were generated that uh, burned everybody alive. 
as, uh, as, as surely as any dead Jewish body that was thrown into the incinerators at Auschwitz. Now, all of this was done under Bomber Harris so they could create as many sacrifices for their devils as possible so that the Hellfire Club could continue into the 21st century. Well, they lost that contest. The Americans were able to kill more. And when the Americans were able to feed these devils more, the devils came to them. I was going to and ask you, um, so are you saying that basically the army are using Satanism and sorcery as a kind of form of warfare? Absolutely. And this is the occult paradigm on which the government of the United States operates. This is where the occult and the elite operate on a paradigm that no normal human being understands. I'll give you an example of this. When you talk about money, you and I would say, uh, Scott Sentinel and Douglas Dietrich would get together and say, Hey, you got any money? I'm out. And of course, you know, Scott would say, no, man, I'm bumming for money myself, uh, you know, because Scott Sentinel and Douglas Dietrich are both dirt poor. Yeah, so it's pretty, we, pretty true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why, that, by the way, that's why Scott Sentinel's in the Ukraine. That's the only place he can afford to buy a lunch. <laughs> it's true. I had to flee London. I just couldn't afford it anymore. You know, <laughs> sandwiches are about a third of the price over here. <laughs> He can finally feed himself now. I, I understand he's actually gained enough weight where he's considering jogging. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe I should go back to London and I can starve myself a bit more. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that would force you. Yeah, you'd probably lose about, you know, 15, 10 pounds during the first month you were there. <laughs> probably would, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to uh, get off the cabbage soup diet, which I'm on at the moment. So let me know what you think of what Douglas said so far, and um, there's more to come in our next episode. We welcome listeners as well as guest speakers on this show, so if you want to come on any time, say hello, or you want to talk about a certain subject or respond to things you've heard on the show, drop us an email at scottsentinel9 at gmail.com, and we'll see if we can get you on via Skype. Don't forget to come and say hi on our other social media such as Facebook and Twitter. Normally if you do a search for Scott Sentinel, Scott Sentinel 9 or just Truth Sentinel, you should come up with um, our various pages. Topics coming up in future episodes could include super soldiers, mysterious celebrity deaths, planned obsolescence, patterns in world events, the Dyatlov Pass incident and religious cults. This is the section where we talk about um, economic markets, sports, space and weather, natural events, any, any of those topics that catch my eye. I'm not going to talk too much about that this week, um, but um, I thought I'd just mention a little bit about Fukushima, which comes under natural disasters, but it's far from being a natural event. I mean, thyroid cancer rates are 40 times higher than normal, according to some sources. And Fukushima was an area where I used to live for a number of years and um, I know one person where I work got cancer and other people got um, tumours. Um, cancer rates across the world are on an increase and it doesn't seem to me that enough people are investigating the real cause, not only about Fukushima but just generally across the world. I mean, I think personally that some of this has to have been caused by nuclear testing that's occurred since the 40s. You can watch that video that I've mentioned before of uh, uh, over a thousand uh, nuclear weapons that have been detonated in various parts of the world since the 40s. Now, there's just the possibility that this is some kind of population control scenario, reducing the population um, as is kind of inferred by the Georgia Guidestones that I've also mentioned on the show before. A bit like a frog being slowly boiled without noticing until it's too late. What if we're all being affected by radiation um, and that it's designed to cut down the population? I mean, that is uh, paranoia spreading, but um, I thought I'd just put that out there. I'm, I wouldn't be the first person to say that. It does seem to me that there is no real desire by governments to find a cure for cancer. Um, if one was found, and there are those that allege that there have been uh, cures for cancer found, it would be crushed under a mountain of uh, bureaucracy, pharmaceutical control, so that it would never actually be made available to the public. Just something to uh, think about. That's uh, it's all very cheery, I know. Remember, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Albert Einstein said that. We are about spreading of tolerance looking for peace, peaceful yet revolutionary change on Truth Sentinel, trying to make a better society which we don't think is happening with our current system of government and we believe that it's 
it's good to talk about it, try to change people's mentality to to talk about mistrust of the government and find a better way. Just get everyone to start talking about it. We don't have to have a revolution with violence. If we all just basically start to realize that something's wrong, which it obviously is, then maybe we can do something about it by initially just accepting that's what's happening. Um, to wind down some positive news, the Sudanese woman I mentioned in a previous show who was sentenced to death for abandoning her Islamic faith has been freed from jail, her lawyer has told the BBC. Miriam Ibrahim's death penalty was overturned by an appeal court, the official Sunnah news agency reported. Uh, she's married to a Christian man and was sentenced under Sharia law to hang for apostasy, which is denying your faith, um, in, in May, basically. Her husband, Daniel Wani, said he was looking forward to seeing her. Now, um, under Sharia law, you cannot deny your faith. I mean, in, in some forms of uh, Islam, such as in Saudi Arabia. Anyway, finally, maybe some uh, happier news. There's a new winner of the world's ugliest dog contest. Uh, his name was Peanut. And if you type into Google, uh, Peanut, world's ugliest dog, uh, you will see quite an ugly dog. I, he does deserve the prize. That's all I'm going to say. So if you get a chance, have a look at him. He's two years old and uh, he won the World's Ugliest Dog Show at the 26th annual competition held in Petaluma, California. Remember, we're always looking for sponsors, advertisers, people who'd like to help finance this show. Please contact us. We're look, uh, also looking for uh, people to help us, uh, guests or researchers or especially people who can help to get more exposure for the program by posting links. Please share our show. Unlike some shows, we, we, we want as many people as possible to listen. Thanks again for listening and catch you later. Goodbye.